Uh, We are in Hebrews, so grab your Bible, if you will, Hebrews chapter 8. I'm going to scare you, all of it. (laughs) So I kept trying to figure out how will I divide this into bite sizes and ain't going to happen. So, you know, often enough you start with a couple of verses and you, you just deal with enough. But before we get there, so grab your Bible, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, um, amazing text we're going to look at today. But uh, uh, on May 8th, you know, that's what, a week and a half away, something like that, is the anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, VE Day, in 1945. And uh, I, I should have I gotten a picture of all of this. Yeah, I can't see the slides, you can. Anyway, but you know, the, the, you, you've seen the pictures, right? The, they're dancing, literally dancing in the streets and spontaneously gathering in, in Trafalgar Square and in front of Buckingham Palace and all these places. And they're just, they're just celebrating. I understand even, even the Germans were celebrating. It was a more muted celebration, but they were. It's over. What good news. The threat and the danger and the horror and all of, all of what looked like the world coming to an end was over, at least, at least for then. And make, and you to put yourself in that moment. And you see all the servicemen, you know, in the pictures in the streets, and they're all, they're, 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 they're hugging each other and finding stray girls that need a kiss. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that was very generous of them, I think, don't you, don't you think? Anyway, <laughs> um, the relief that that must have been to no longer have your life in danger, no longer have your life in jeopardy, no longer see people that you love going into a place where they may not come back, seeing horrible things that no one should ever see. And so when that's plastered across the billboards and written in chalk on the walls and on, on small towns where they were riding it across the, 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 you know, welcome to Smallville kind of thing. Maybe not really Smallville, but riding it across there, you know, war is over, victory in Europe. What a moment. What a moment. Good news. Good news. So when we come into chapter 8 of Hebrews in our series here, where we're looking at um, really in, in many ways what what Dr. Mitchell used to describe, one of my mentors, he would describe as, as the, the ministry of Jesus in heaven for us now. And this chapter sums up so much of what we've been looking at. We've been looking at that at, everything's leading up to Jesus being the high priest. There is no other high priest. There are no other priests. There is only one. And somebody that tells you there is a priest uh, of some kind here on earth, they're selling you something. Don't listen, because there are no other priests. There is one, Jesus Christ, and he is seated at the right hand of God. Amen? Amen. And we're going to talk about that. And so when we go through all of these chapters, and as you know, he's been sprinkling in here that Jesus is a priest according to the order of? Okay, you guys are so good. And so you can even pronounce that word, right? And so, (laughs) and, and nobody knew that Melchizedek was so important until Jesus showed up. I wonder, though, if some people were beginning to question, surely somebody was questioning, about the, the efficacy, the, the effectiveness of, of the Levitical priesthood. And so what Paul is talking about here as he's been leading up to chapter 8 is that Jesus is better, right? Right? He's a better revelation. He's better than the angels. He's better than, than Adam. He's better than Moses. He's better than the law. He has a better covenant. He has a better sacrifice. It's better, 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 better. Everything is better. And he, here we are. We're coming down to a better chapter that takes all of these things and, and distills it down. But he's still not done. There's still more to say. But he's going to touch on something that is, that is good news. Now I know most of you know the gospel and you'd be able to witness to someone and share the gospel yourselves with somebody. You'd be able to do that. So I'm not going to tell you something that you haven't heard today. But what I'd like you to do is just put, your, put yourself in that moment. Put yourself 
in that, that mindset that this is good news. I think sometimes we get awfully comfortable. We get awfully comfortable in our relationship with God and we begin to take for granted, we take for granted our salvation. We do, don't we? And, and, you know, I just kind of, it's like, did you just notice the mood change in the room when you said that? Therapists pick up on that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't, I can't help it. But um, it's almost like, <gasps> that's right, we do. Well, today we're going to freshen that up a bit, okay? So, um, I thought the last song was a great choice. It is well with my soul. Our warfare is over. Look at Isaiah chapter 40 real quick. Isaiah 40. I tell you my page number, but it doesn't do you any good because you don't have this Bible. But you've heard all of this. This is, this is where the, the Assyrians have been destroyed. God has wiped them out in front of, of Israel. They, um, Sennacherib was attacking Israel. And, was, and his, his general was dumb enough to put a threat against, against Israel and against Israel's God in a, writing, a written letter and lob it over the wall to Hezekiah. Hezekiah took it into the temple and rolled it out. And, and uh, Sennacherib had said, your God is no different than the God of all the other nations. And I will destroy you and him also. Butter the popcorn. This is going to be fun to watch. <laughs> eh, maybe not so fun. But when the smoke had settled and there was thousands and thousands of dead soldiers that had died overnight laying in front of their city and across the horizon, put yourself in this in this moment across the horizon because the Assyrians had destroyed and killed everyone they could. They were like locusts. They would come in and destroy everything. And so when they opened the gates of Jerusalem, there would be little plumes of smoke around in the horizon of burning villages. Whoa. Most of the nation had been wiped out. It was a holocaust. They've had several, not just one. And so in this moment, in this moment, there is good news in Isaiah 40. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has what? Ended. Ended that her iniquity has been removed. Hallelujah. That she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Wow. What words would those be like in that moment when all they could see, and sometimes in our lives that's all we can see, is just destruction and rubble all around us. But there's good news. Because the warfare is over, and our iniquity has been forgiven. It has been washed away, not just transferred to an animal, but washed away forever. The Bible tells us that God takes our sin and he deposits, he deposits it in the sea, someplace that is bottomless and we could never get down to find it again. He talks about our sin being placed as far is from the east is from the west. That's an infinite line, is it not? When could you stop going west? That's a dumb question. Just keep going and keep going because there, no, there is no way to measure that. What's the point? It's over. It's done. 
there's good news, you're no longer in danger. You are safe, safe in the hands of God. So this whole, this whole letter is written. I'm just getting warmed up. This whole letter... <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I love being in a small church. It's so fun. <laughs> Good. Keep coming. Anyway, we have been doing this study in Hebrews, and Hebrews is about Jesus being the replacement of the old mosaic system. This is why the sacrificial system doesn't exist anymore because Jesus replaced it. And what was happening is the Hebrew people in that time, as you know, they were in danger of drifting back to what was familiar to them, going back to Judaism and the law and the sacrifices and trying to maintain that as if the Messiah had never come. This is what they were drifting back to. And you know, we can, we can point a bony finger at, the, at those Jewish people in that time but haven't we done the same thing several times over? Amen. You know, we're not so special. They weren't so special. I think they're a little more artsy about it. Maybe they did a better job of it than we did. But haven't we rolled over into all of these legalistic religions again and again and forgotten the God of grace? Part of that is recreating or inventing some kind of priesthood that stands between us and God when there is none. And this is poisonous and this is dangerous and it's unbiblical. So either we're going to follow the scripture or we're not. Which do you choose? Anyway, verse 1. We're going to try to get through this whole chapter. Yeah. And a, and a wave of unbelief rolled across the crowd. <laughs> Verse 1. Now the main point in what has been said is this. Don't you like it when finally there's a clear summary? You're reading along in the Bible and some, have you noticed the Bible's kind of hard to read sometimes? Yeah. It's just me? Sometimes it's hard to read. Yeah. Well, if you want a clear spot, here's it. Once in, a while, once in a while, it would be nice to have a neon sign saying, this is what we're talking about here. And you don't have to wade through a lot of context, which is beautiful and I love doing that as maybe you've noticed. I also enjoy the context of the, of the cultural background and the history and all this. It's wonderful. But every once in a while, it is nice to just get close to the finish line and have something. Here's, here's what this is. Okay? Amen. So, now the main point is what, and what has been said is this. We have such a high priest. I mean, that in itself... Just that modifier, such a high priest. I mean, we could, we could just let that grow in our hearts and our minds and just let that expand all the way from horizon to horizon because, and beyond because we have a living God who died on the cross for us. And he is now between us and anything else that could get between us. There is no gap between you and your Savior. He loves you. And by the way, even on your worst day, because every once in a while we, we kind of forget something. Here's a reminder. Have all your sins been paid for? How many? All of them. How about the one that you just committed this morning? <laughs> Behold an Israelite in whom is no guile. <laughs> an honest man. Who was that Greek guy with a lamp that was looking for an honest man? We've got him. We got him. Bring him in. But that's what it seems like, doesn't it? Sometimes it seems like we're, we're standing before God's presence as if we are 900 pounds of sin on a popsicle stick and we don't know how to deal with it and surely God is sick of me by now. At that moment, we are slipping. We're not, we're not in danger of losing our soul. It's not that. But we are slipping out of a clear understanding of what grace is all about. We could not save ourselves. He had to pay the entire price. This is what propitiation is all about. We're going to see this in a, in a few minutes. 
The main point is this. What, what all of what's been said up from, all the way from chapter 1 to chapter 7, the main point has been said is this. We have such a high priest, the one that's been described all this way, all the way through, who is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. Can you see it? I'm not sure I can because I need to squint. It is so bright and so beautiful and so pure. And Revelation does the best it can to describe those scenes. I'll let, I'll let Lyle, you know, if you've got a question, talk to Lyle. He knows about that stuff. You're welcome. And, and so... <laughs> But the, the picture of the throne and, and, and the, the green light and, the, and the, the still glassy sea, there is no storm. There is no, no, no lostness here. We have this high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So we're going to un- unpack that idea of, of, of why he has taken a seat. We'll, we'll see that in, in coming chapters. But just to spoil all the thunder that I could possibly have in those chapters coming up, come anyway, is that his job is done. There's nothing else that needs to be done. It is complete. There is no half-baked salvation. That's a theological term. There is no half-baked salvation where you, you get in the door and you get your introduction and now you have to finish it yourself. That somehow you're still in jeopardy that you have to be good enough We know this is not true. He paid for all the sins of the world, not just some of them. And this is why, this is why I'm going to upset some of my friends out there. This is why I cannot adhere to limited atonement. There isn't a limited atonement. It isn't just for the elect because all of creation was stained and defiled by Adam's fall. All of it. And so all of it had to be cleansed. So his, his death paid for everything, all of it. So then why isn't everybody saved? Because we have to come to him and we simply have to turn away from the lie of the devil that we can do it on our own and live self-sufficiently. We have to turn back and put all of our life into his hands and, and live every day from then on because now it's the truth every day in dependence upon him. Will we do that perfectly? (laughs) Yeah, I thought not. Anyway, but you know, this is Reno and odds are important here. The, the, The odds, the odds of you living a perfect Christian life are pretty slim. Can you point to somebody in the Bible who actually pulled that off? You win. I was thinking... I was thinking more like us types, you know, and, and you know, and Jesus, D, Jesus and Daniel, Jesus, we should just pray and take an offering and kind of, kind of done. I'm halfway through the first verse. Come on here. Anyway, Jesus and Daniel, are the only people in the Bible to whom no sin is ever recorded, but everybody else is. So I'm not sure why Daniel isn't, isn't recorded uh, of, of sin, but he never claimed. He, never, he, he claimed he needed a savior too. We just don't know what he was up to, right? But everybody else, these amazing people who walk with God in these beautiful and breathtaking ways that God has used to do stunning things in history, they all know they have feet of clay. We all know. This isn't about getting to the end of the race to be perfect so now God owes you something. This is simply about living by simple faith to walk with God in such a way that he lives his life through you and so there's no other explanation for you but that Jesus lives in you, flaws included. And so if you can walk that way, that's perfect. Remember, perfect doesn't mean ideal. Perfect means complete. Perfect means everything is supplied that's needed. That's what perfect means. 
And we have this high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. You know, there's people out there, and Peter warns us of this, that there will be people that are saying, well, where is the promise of his coming? You know, everything's going on the way it always has been. So where is this Jesus guy that says he's coming? I'll tell you where he is. I know exactly where he is. He's at the right hand of the seat of power. That's where he is. And remember, this is not where he's just sitting there with his feet up. He's seated at the right hand of what? Power. This is, this is the Son of God. This is one, one aspect of the Trinity. And in him, through him, is all the person of the Godhood. All of it. This is the Lamb of God that was slain. This is the one who will sit on the great white throne. This is the one who will recreate everything. Praise God. Now I finally got my grass green. But he is seated at the right hand of the throne of heavens, and he's not just sitting there. He strengthens you. He reveals himself to you. He teaches you. He holds you. And those amazing verses, I mean, we could just go on and on and on about the stuff he does in your life. But one of the most precious ones is that all those that the Father has put, has given to me, has put in my hand, I lose none. Isn't that the bottom line? I mean, all the rest of your life can be wonderful, or maybe it was just, uh, it's just, just glad you got to the finish line, brother. Maybe that's all you got going. Remember the thief on the cross? I love that story, the way Alist- Alistair Begg tells it. I, I, you know, you've heard me tell this again, so I love the story, and you know what I'm talking about, right? This video where they're trying to figure out, you know, it's, it's the angels in heaven talking to, talking to this thief on the cross, and they're trying to figure out, what are you doing here? And you stand there in heaven, of course, this is all, right, for fun, and they're standing there and saying, how did you get here? And he says, I don't know. Well, how did you get here? I don't know. So, okay, we'll just wait here. And they go get the head angel and bring him in, you know, and he's interviewing him. So, so we just have a few questions for you. So um, do you understand the, the doctrine of, of justification by faith? Do you, do you, no, I've never heard of it. Do you, do you get, do you, do you, well, well then how about we'll go right to the doctrine of scripture. Do you get that? You guys just staring at him, right? So, well, so. How did you get here? What are you doing here? And he says, the man on the cross in the middle said I could come. This isn't about beating ourselves off with false guilt or trying to prove to God that we're better than someone else. We are simply walking with him and he does through us what he pleases. Amen. Now, does that mean we shouldn't put some effort into it? That's nonsense. Of course we do. Because we are to strive to know him better. As we strive to know him better, that life, his life within us will transform us into being a new and better walk version of ourselves so that he can display himself in his glory through you. Now, the main point in all of them said is this, we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Do you hear all these really cool Jewish images here? He's talking to Jewish people. So, you know, hang up, keep up. It's important you know these things. So the main point in all this, in all of Hebrews is we have this high priest and he is seated at the right hand, interceding for us. And just rattle through a couple of verses. Ephesians 1.20. For which he brought about in... Well, we'll back up to 19. And what is, the, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which, is, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. Psalm 110.1, 1. 
just before the promise of, of Melchizedek that Jesus would be a priest forever, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Wow. Luke 22, 69. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Because it is completed, and that means he has the same, when you're seated at the right hand, you have the same power as the person to whom you are seated next to. You share it, it's equal. This is not a step down. People misunderstand the term son of God. What that means is God incarnated as a human being. It doesn't mean he took a step down from who he is. He chose to act as one of us and live by faith. That's how we can see how it's done. But he is no less a part of, a part of and equal to God. Amen. A minister, he is a servant. The Son of Man came to, not to be served, but to serve. He is still serving there. He is still holding you tight. He is still leading you closer to himself. When we abide in Him, what it says in John 14, when we abide in Him, He will abide in us. It also says that and He will make the, he and the Father will make their abode with us. He'll make His home in you. And He will reveal Himself to you. I love the word there. The word is disclose. It's like opening, opening your, your, your robe and saying, this, this is who I am. Can you see my heart? This is, this is the promise we have. This is the priest we have who is a minister of us, minister to us, seated at the right hand of power. So there is no lack of power to do what he chooses to do in your heart. He talks about the sanctuary and the true tabernacle. The true tabernacle is, is just a... Is, is a, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was a place where God would dwell among men. You know, you remember what Emmanuel means? You know, you, you've, you've had Christmas, right? Right? Okay, you remember Christmas? That was like five minutes ago. And I was going to tell you how many shopping days there are till Christmas. I forgot. But anyway, I'll just, I'll just scare you with it. Oh my gosh, that's right. It's, it's almost July. Here we go. Anyway, so the tabernacle was always a place for God to dwell among his people. But there was a problem. Because there was sin and fallenness between the people and himself. There was no atonement yet. So they had this elaborate tent with all of these elaborate symbols set up throughout this elaborate tent so that they would understand the problem of sin between themselves and him, but also the, the glory and the love and the mercy of the Father to them. Are you with me so far? That's what the tabernacle was for. But now, he's in, well, I want to come back to Christmas. And you shall call his name, which means God with us. In the, what the theological term is the eschaton, in those days, in those days where there is, there is eternity has started and Jesus will be, well, first of all, he'll be there at the thousand year reign, right? He will be among men. But then in his glory, he will be with us once he returns. At the end of the tribulation, once he returns, he will always be with us, walking among us. He, he desires to be among us. And remember in the garden before the fall, what did he used to do in the afternoon? He would go walk with Adam. <sighs> wow. In the cool of the afternoon, that's when the work is done. You know the best time in camping? You guys are cleared out of the spit zone, right? <laughs> the, the best time in camping is, is, you know, you're all set up, like you go back. You, did anybody else backpack besides me? I knew I liked you. Yes. <laughs> you don't? You bivouac. It's different. Yes, it's vastly different. 
<laughs> but anyway, these military guys are so cool. Anyway, so that, it's that time where, you know, you, you've, you've gone up the mountain, you found your spot, you set your, your tent up, you set your, your stuff up, you know, and you're, you're, you're cooking some freeze-dried thing that actually tastes really good. And, uh, and the sun is just starting to get low and it's beginning to cool. The work of the day is done. The journey of the day is over and you're set up and you're just waiting for the stars to come out. And for me, that is the best time of the day. That is sweet. And so God would, work with, would walk with Adam in the cool of the day when the work was done. Do you get the picture? Do you get the picture? We don't earn our salvation. He does it all. That's what the whole Sabbath commandment was about. But don't get me started on that. We, we'll never get out of here. <laughs> anyway. One more thing about this, these first two verses. There is a man in heaven. There is a man, a flesh and blood man in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, interceding for you. Every moment, every day, there is a man in heaven. And there will come a time when we can walk up. And I, I, I was going to say shake his hand, but I don't think that's going to be good enough. We will throw ourselves at his feet. But I can't imagine, maybe this is just my Americanness coming out, but I can't imagine not being able to hold him, to hug him, and being held in his arms. Hallelujah. We have such a high priest. Verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest, Jesus, also have something to offer. Now chapter 9 really unpacks that for us. So we're not going to go very far into that verse. But Aaron's priesthood only had earthly offerings, basically animals' lives, and some plant products. It's about, it's about all they had. And how could that possibly have interceded between the sin that we committed against the absolute holy living God? How could a goat have something to do with that? Or a bull have something to do with that? Or some grain that we would wave or pour wine out? What would that have to do with our sin? There's no way it could have done any good. It was simply a picture. It was just a holdover. So Aaron's priesthood only had, only had earthly offerings and animals' lives. But Christ has this divine, eternal life, a life that has no beginning and has no end, was never created, will never come to an end. And, and the image that I, I, which is dangerous with God, but my, the only way I can imagine God is if we, could, if we were standing before him, and conscious of his presence. And there he is speaking to us. And he would be so gentle. And so kind. Because he is meek and gentle of heart, right? And he would be so tender with us. But that person that we would be aware of goes beyond the horizon and goes beyond the horizon to the vanishing points and there's no way to trace or map the vastness of God, Amen. either in time or space or wisdom or power or glory or holiness. All of that is focused in that human being. Who could have thought of that? So Christ had this divine, eternal life to offer for sin. That'll cover it. Nothing else will. He is holy, undefiled, and separated from sinners, just as it said in chapter 7. And one of the gifts, one of the gifts that God has, one of the gifts that the Savior has is you. Do you feel like a gift? <laughs> 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 
sometimes. You got two honest guys in here. We're, we're moving along. We're moving along. Sometimes maybe we do. But a lot of times I'm kind of doubtful that God would view me as a gift. But he does. Not because I've done anything special, but because he took my old life out and crucified it and he put his life in, in me in its place. That's what it means to be born again. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it's necessary that this high priest also have something to offer and he has you. He had himself as the sacrifice to pay the way, but now he has you. Maybe it would be wise if we look at our lives. Am I living as a gift? Am I living as a gift to God? Would I be a sacrifice that would please him? This isn't for your salvation. It's just, without trying to sound irreverent, just to put a smile on God's face. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call you brethren. He seems to value you as someone he would present to the Father with pleasure. I told you this is a good chapter. Is, is, is it good so far? Okay. He had to say that because that's polite. But anyway, now if he, verse 4, now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are those who offer gifts according to the law. Now, now doesn't Psalm 110.4 say that you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek? What, what do you mean he's not a priest at all? Because we also see, we also see some stuff in, in, uh, when, he was, when he was at the upper room and he says, this blood, you know, this cup is the, is the blood of the new covenant, Right? When he says that, the new covenant, the old covenant, the old mosaic sacrificial system is dead. But he also said way earlier before that in John 14, 6, I am the way, you know the rest of it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other priest then. It's Jesus or nothing. Jesus or no one. He was already a priest. What does he mean here then? Is that a contradiction in the Bible? No, because the priest, the physical temple and all of that, um, all of that, um, I don't know, what's, I don't want to use the word cult, but that's what they call, that's what religion, but yeah, the stuff that they're, well, I want to be a little more reverent than that, but, um, but I, I hear you, because at that point it became, it became pointless, it became moot. But all of the procedures, all of the, the very careful, detailed things that they had to go through to represent what it meant to come before God and offer a sacrifice and what the sacrifice was about, all of that was now made obsolete. But Jesus himself was not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah. And according to the regulations of the temple sacrifice and worship, he, as a, as a part of the tribe of Judah, would not be allowed to offer sacrifice. Instead, what he did is he offered himself on the cross, on the cross. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. And he appeared before God in the tabernacle above the presence, the actual presence of God. Not a tent, but the actual presence of God. So he wouldn't be a priest at all as long as the temple was standing. But on the earth, that temple at the time when he was written was still in place. And the Levitical sacrificial system was still, was still going on. However, I'm not sure how they were pulling that off. Because remember when Jesus died and he said, it is finished, you know what happened? The veil, the veil split from top to bottom. And it opened the way now to the Holy of Holies for anyone to come in. There was no longer any barrier. So I'm not sure how they, they continued their, their processes. I'm guessing they just said, wow, this is really bad. Let's not tell anybody. Yeah. <clears throat> Get the sewing kit. Okay. So, <laughs> but even, even, but they had nothing sufficient on earth to offer. Verse five. So, these guys, though, who serve a co as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which is shown you on the mountain. 
In Exodus 24 to 29, there was, there was chapter after chapter after chapter of these detailed descriptions of, of making the Ark of the Covenant. And you guys know what that is because you've seen Indiana Jones, right? And so there's that. And you also, and there was the veil they were supposed to make, and there was the table of showbread, and the laver, and the, the, the altar of bird sacrifice, and all this stuff over and over and over, all this detailed stuff that they were supposed to make it just so. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So this is what this is talking about. But it is, it is simply a copy. It is a shadow. It is a symbol. It is a model. It's not the real thing. It's a stand-in. The pattern was to represent heaven's tabernacle, the presence of God. And there's nothing in heaven that can be represented by anything on earth. God is different. This is why the second command is in place. So this is, this is what this, all of this elaborate construction was for. It was just a symbol. But now, now the symbol has been fulfilled and there's no longer any need for it. Verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, better than Levi, better than Aaron, better than Moses. Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry because by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which, he has, which has been enacted on better promises. Because remember, Aaron and, and Levi never had promises that they would be priests. They were commissioned to be priests, and as long as those generations continued, they would be acting as a priest. But there's no such promise to them that they would be a priest forever. And this has been echoed and echoed over and over in Hebrews. Four different times that verse is quoted all by itself, but it's implied with other places as well. So now he has this more excellent ministry in which he is now ministering to us by the power of the Father so that we are then representatives of him and his life on earth. But he has this better covenant. Now, Part of the thing is, there's this thing about a covenant. We've talked about this. Do you know the difference between a covenant and a contract, right? We talked about this last week, I think. Um, and often we just think of a covenant as, as a contract. It's not. It's not the same thing. A contract has, has regulations. A contract has requirements. You have to keep your end of the contract. I have to keep my end of the contract. Or the contract is broken. It's null and void. Sometimes there's penalties. A covenant is different. A covenant is... I have responsibilities, you have responsibilities, but if either one of us fail, the surviving one will pick up the other person and carry them across the finish line. They won't let you fail. Amen. God made a covenant with Abraham. They failed in the law. But God created a new covenant so that they would not fail again. That they would still that they would still cross that line and so that, so that all Israel will be saved. That's what he said. So he's not going to let them fail. And brothers and sisters, he's not going to let us fail either. He will not let you fail. He's obtained a more excellent ministry because it is a better covenant. It is, to put it simply, it's more effective. It worked. The others failed. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. That's a good point. But it's this, this thing didn't start in the New Testament. If we go back to Jeremiah 31, and you've got, it right, you've got the text right here, verse 8, for finding fault with them, with who? We'll talk about that. For finding fault with them, he says, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a what? A new covenant... Not the covenant with Moses, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of who? Not Levi. Not Levi. Levi is the priestly class, right? The, priest, the priestly tribe. Now it goes to Judah. Now I would, I suppose, I don't know how the ancients thought of this, but they probably thought, well, it must have something to do with David. Absolutely, because he was the king, right? And Jesus sits on the throne of David also. But this, this is bigger than that. Verse 9, not like the covenant which I made with, your, with their fathers. You can hear God's passion here, that he will make a new covenant. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. 
This new covenant was already foretold in Jeremiah's day. This is 500 years before Jesus. The new covenant is with Israel and Judah, not Levi. Jesus, not Levi. And it's not like Exodus 32. You remember the story in Exodus 32? Jesus has been up in the, in the, on, on Sinai. He's receiving the Ten Commandments. He's got these two tablets, right? And he walks down carrying these tablets. And what's going on in the camp? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, they're having quite a party. And the, the word's very, very delicate the way, they, and they rose up to play. What that means, it was a drunken orgy worshiping idols. They had put together this, this golden cap. How did Aaron do this? It's those days you kind of you wonder, Moses, was it really such a good idea that you really demanded of God that Aaron come with you? Was that a good idea? Because God tried to talk him out of it, and Moses wouldn't, wouldn't listen. So, okay, all right, here's your brother. And, and Moses said, you know, because I can't talk. All right, I'll send Aaron with you, because he can talk, but this is really going to be complicated. Anyway, God redeemed the whole thing anyway and made, made it work because that's what he does. He's amazing. And so here's this, here's this situation where he comes down the mountain with the, the Ten Commandments and they're having this orgy and he takes, the, he takes the tablets and he throws them and they shatter. We talked about that last time. Why did he do that? Because it was, a, and God never, never questioned him on it. God never corrected him. I'd be very afraid to break something that God had given me. Anyway, so he throws it. They break because they had just broken the covenant. Remember they said, you go talk to God. We'll do whatever you say. Meanwhile, they're living like this down in the valley. They had already broken their word. So that covenant was, was never intended to be, to be permanent. That's what that tells us. That it, it, it can be broken. It will be broken. It's going to go away. So it's not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they didn't want to go. For they did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for them. And we, we, when we look at the, the way Hebrews itself describes this, you go back to, down to the end of chapter three and it talks about, you know, who was he angry in the wilderness and who was it that died out there? All of these people that came out of Egypt, why didn't they go into the promised land? And these chilling words at the end of chapter 3, because of unbelief. They saw all of this and they didn't believe. They want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back to slavery, to the darkness, to the paganism, to oppression. What? Because they missed their garlic. Now, I like garlic as much as the next man, but maybe we should ask you about the potluck now. But anyway, and so all that generation, they died in the wilderness. But then in verse 10, we see a change here. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And it's, it's a new covenant, right? He says, I'm going to make a new covenant. Not like that one. I'm going to make one like this. And this, the, the beauty of this, the glory of this just glows off the page. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. This one, not the old one. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Why not? All will know him. No more need for evangelism. No stragglers. No one left behind. No one lost. No one dead in their sin. All will know me from the least to the greatest of them. There's not a big gap between those two, so don't get excited about that. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 36 talks about the new covenant also. If you can find Ezekiel, right after Jeremiah. Jeremiah Lamentations, Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel 36 has this beautiful passage in it, picking up verse 26. We can't go into the whole thing, but, but he's talking about this new covenant. And he's talking about the transformation that's going to take place because that's what this is about. I will write, I will write myself onto their hearts. My laws, how I am, will, will be on their minds. And just, just real quick on that, I probably don't really have time for this, but what's, what's, what's beautiful about this is Jesus was asked by a lawyer. You know the story, right? What's the greatest commandment? And he was probably expecting, oh, number six. You know, some answer like that. What he gets is a three-part answer. He says, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is what? Like it. It's equated. It's not lesser. It's not different. It's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two great commandments stand all of the law and the prophets. Everything God wants from us is contained in love him with everything you have. And because man is created in his image, love men with everything you have. And both of those are reciprocal attachments. Amen. We love because he first loves us. And I'm supposed to love you as Christ loved the church, I'm supposed to love you with everything I have the way I want to be loved. <laughs> and the cool thing is, you got the same commandment. <laughs> you got to love me back. <laughs> Even in the spit zone. <laughs> this, is the, this is the covenant he's making with us, that he will transform us. In Ezekiel 36, it says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, a dead heart, an idolatrous heart. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, one that beats, one that's alive, that has blood in it. I will put my spirit within you and cause you, I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You're not going to do this yourself. You can't. And if you haven't figured that out yet, see me after. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. We cannot live the Christian life. So what he did is he, he, took, he knew that. So he took all the junk out of us and he put himself in it. He put his life within us and then empowered it by the Holy Spirit. Two different things. And then the Father, the Father hovers over us in a blessing. Amen. All of the Trinity is involved in our salvation. This is his new covenant of the blood. Verses 10 and 11 tell us basically that in, in, this, in this condition, everyone you know will know Jesus. Everyone you know will know Jesus. What will C-SPAN have to broadcast? Everyone, yeah, we don't have to talk about CNN because they'll be gone. <laughs> They're almost gone now. Anyway, um, the, the point here is that we will be transformed. It will be natural for us, natural for us to walk with God, natural for us to walk with God, to be godly. We won't be, we won't be trying to play catch up. We will have been transformed. You might know this verse. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creation. You might have heard that somewhere before. Behold, everything, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. Hallelujah. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I who live. He lives in me. Amen. If we are born again, we have this life in us. And so we have this, I heard it said one time that before we were Christian, we had, this, we had this taste for sin and an allergy to righteousness. 
Now that we have come to Christ, we have this taste for righteousness and an allergy to sin. Just, doesn't it just kind of make you itch? You know, like, gosh, what am I doing this for? If it doesn't, see me after. The first covenant included Israel, whether they were believers or not. It was a national covenant. Yes, the, the, the implication is, the intention was that they would all come to simple faith like Abraham did. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. But, but that first covenant with the sacrificial system was simply to get them all there learning about God because these were pagans coming out of Egypt and they didn't know Yahweh. So this is what this was for, to instruct them so they could come to know God by coming into contact with the priesthood. This is what they were supposed to do. But this second one is for only believers. Only believers are included in this because we are the only ones propitiated. Now you look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. There's the priesthood that he might be a, faith, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To what? To make propitiation for the sins of the people. And you know what propitiation means? This ridiculous overpayment that swamps the debt. Verse 13, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. There's no longer a need for the Mosaic system. There's no longer a need to measure our acceptance to God by our failures. There's this new covenant. He's made the first obsolete, and whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. This is the blood. This is my body. This is the blood of the new covenant inaugurated by my blood. See, this finishes the thought he started in verse 7, but he, he, so, and then he inserts the new covenant of Jeremiah in the middle, and this is just magnificent, is it not? The Mosaic sacrificial system, the priesthood and the temple would be destroyed in only a few years after Hebrews was written. It was going to be wiped away, and just as Jesus said, not one stone would remain upon another. So it was passing away, and these people were in this transition time between one dispensation and the next. They were transitioning out of the Mosaic Covenant, and they were to walk with Jesus, and they refused to go. Just like they didn't want to leave Egypt. Just like they didn't want to give up the, the Asherah poles and the, the Baal worship on the mountaintops. It was replaced then, the old covenant was replaced with a better relationship with God. No veil, no more blood required, because the blood of the cross was enough. The blood of the cross was enough. The new covenant is forever. Let that soak in a minute. The new covenant is forever. There is no beginning to it. There is no end because he was always a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, was he not? And so his life was always eternal with no beginning and no end. He was always the priest. It simply hadn't been enacted yet on the cross. And so when he died on the cross, it was enough. The new covenant is forever and your relationship with Jesus, with the Savior is forever. So take a breath and relax. There are people that fear that they're going to come in and out of salvation and there are church denominations that teach this as if, as if it's a revolving door. You come in and out and in and out and in and out. This is exhausting. So then I guess I have to be saved again and again and again and again. In that case, the priest is not seated. It's not over. It's not done. It has to be done again and again and again. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but this is what the Catholics believe. They re-sacrifice Jesus on the altar every time they say a mass because they don't understand that his sacrifice was enough. They don't have propitiation. They're trying to insert themselves between you and God. And isn't that what the devil does? You have to belong to this group. 
or you're not really saved. You're going to be baptized by this group, or you're not really saved. But Abraham believed God and was counted him as righteousness. But this thing is forever. We looked in, in the last chapter, verse 25, about, about we are saved forever. He is able to save forever because he lives forever. And that word can also be translated to the uttermost. Which is it, forever or uttermost? Yes, it is. I'm not a disappointment to him. He's not ashamed of me. I may have my moments where I'm ashamed of me. He is not ashamed of me because he knows his blood was sufficient and he knows the life that lives in me, his very own son, he himself dwells within us, that that is sufficient. There is nothing short of that. All of sin and fall short of what? The glory of God. But now you have that dwelling within you. Doesn't make you God. But it makes you glorious and satisfactory to him. He's not ashamed of you. So many Christians don't know what happened when they were born again. You're not a disappointment. He's not ashamed of you. He knows where you came from. He also knows where you're headed. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Just as is it written, as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man. All that God has prepared for those who love him. He knows where you're headed. The new covenant is not just ages past of sin and, and, and future heaven. It is all of that. But the new covenant is peace with God within you now today. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It is a real and new and a good identity. When God creates something new, we have this treasury in earthen vessels that the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this new identity. You and I, if we've given our heart to Christ, if we have, if we have believed in him, turn from the darkness, just simply turn to him. That's all there is to that. Then you are someone in whom dwells the very life of Jesus Christ. Not one like it, the very same one. That's what you're made of now. That changes your identity. You are not a sinner saved by grace. There's no such thing. You're either a saint or you ain't. <laughs> this life gives you real meaning and purpose in your life. We just spend our days and then we die. Is that it? Then nothing. But we have, we know that this is not heaven. This is not heaven. We have a new creation ahead of us. We have, we have after the rapture, we will be with him. I don't know what we're going to do up there. I don't care. I just want to get on the bus. I just want to go. <laughs> but we will have real meaning and purpose for our life now because there are people around us who don't know the Savior. There are things that I can do to please him simply because I want to make him smile. I got purpose in life. And to sound a little more therapeutic, all of your attachment needs will be fulfilled. <laughs> we need him, he needs us. The most fundamental human drive, even more than survival, is to be attached in an emotionally safe relationship. John 3.16 sets up an emotionally safe relationship. And it shows that we are like that because he is like that. And we will be above with the saints in glory. Amen. And we can love each other now. These, this is family for us. People walk in the door that we're just getting to know again. Amen. And we love them. And people are moving on to another phase of life and we will miss you and we love you. Amen. And your dog. <laughs> and our attachments. Yeah, I know. And isn't that the sweetness of it? We know these people love us. Oh, they got their quirks and they're not perfect. Neither am I, so what? But we love each other. And we're doing life together until he takes us. I can't think of a better investment. 
of my life. We have, we have this Savior. We have this High Priest. It's not a wish. It's a fact. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We pray, Lord, for maybe someone who's watching this who's never heard about Jesus this way. Maybe there's someone watching this morning on a video or, or we'll be watching later. And all they need is a simple prayer. Just turn your heart to Jesus. You can have purpose and love and direction and all your attachment needs can be met. And you'll be loved by the Savior and your Father. our Father will love you. And they will make their abode with you and disclose himself to you. And your life will have purpose and direction. And we thank you for that for us today. But also, Lord, we're about to have a potluck. And I pray that you will, you will bless that food to the good of our bodies. But more than that, that your spirit will come and hover over all the conversations and all the connections we make today. Because you love us so deeply, more than we can even imagine. And we'll use this time to draw closer to you through each other. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.